Lee Levikoff is the vice network vice president of network operations and director of facilities, director of construction of a 1.4 billion hospital network. Lee has overseen 500 million of construction over the last four fiscal years. Serving in this capacity, Lee is able to apply his 38 years of construction management and general contracting experience on the owner's behalf. This knowledge has, been, has proven to be an invaluable asset as it relates to construction cost scheduling and contract negotiation. Dr. Catherine- Michelle, Michelle, one second. Just yes. want to let everybody know before you introduce the real star. That's that would be obviously <laughs> that would obviously be Katie. We've grown since then, so we're not 1.4. Just to let everybody know, we're closer to three billion. Oh, so, doubled. Okay. <laughs> just to let you know, I, for some reason, I must have sent you old old stuff. So I apologize, and I'm a lot older since then, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now now I can introduce the star of the show. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Dr. Catherine C. Warlow is the founder and CEO of Life Air Systems. She received her doctorate in anatomy and cell physiology from the University of Virginia School of Medicine and completed her postdoctoral fellowship in reproductive physiology and infertility at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She served as the scientific director of IVF programs for over 20 years. Her work led to development and design of the Life Air Systems patented air purification technology, which is now protecting over 50 IVF clinics in the world. It is also improving patient care and operating rooms, intensive care units, pharmacies, and long-term care facilities. Dr. Warlow has authored over 60 scientific papers and chapters, served as an invited editor and reviewer for leading textbooks and journals, and has been invited to speak both nationally and internationally. In addition, as an advocate of science education, she currently serves on the board of trustees at several educational and science organizations. She is the co-author of the book, Clean Room Technology in Art Clinics, The Critical Role of Air Quality. Most recently, Pennsylvania governor's administration highlighted how Life Air's revolutionary air purification technology designed the combat and help recover from the economic effects of the coronavirus. And now I'll turn it over to Lee and Dr. Warlow. Welcome, thanks for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. All right, I'll start to share my screen. Geez, with that information right there, Katie, are we, do we have any time left? <laughs> Let's just wrap this up in five minutes. Was I right about her being the star or what? <laughs> no, <Are> no. <laughs> Far from it. Um, thank you, Michelle. And, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, Lee and I are thrilled to be here with you uh, and to share with you really a transformational air purification technology, one that is purposed, it's patented, and most importantly to each of you, it's proven. And in one of the most demanding environments, uh, the, the environment of healthcare. So what we'd like to do is just share with you, let me advance this, share with you the very unique genesis of the technology, how it differs from others, and uh, very importantly, a very large body of environmental and clinical evidence proving its effectiveness in delivery and its complete comprehensive kill of all airborne infectious um, viruses, bacteria, fungi, um, all peer reviewed and, and published data over 8,500 patients and two 12 to 15 month uh, clinical trials. And then I'd like to pass the baton to the true star of this <laughs> presentation, Lee Levikoff, who is going to really walk you through uh, the engineering and implementation details uh, of the Life Air solution specific to your spaces. So the genesis of our technology, move this here. The genesis of our technology really comes from over 20 years of environmental and clinical research in human in vitro fertilization or IVF. Uh, as a clinical provider, of IVF, we are absolutely driven to protect the culture environment of the living cell, which you're trying to culture and successfully grow outside of the body for six to seven days. So once we learned the airborne metrics that were so impactful 
to our success, to our clinical success, we sought to purchase a commercial system that would deliver these metrics. And honestly, much to my surprise, there was nothing we could purchase to deliver the airborne metrics we had learned were so significant. And that is what led to the design of the life air system. But because we wanted to design it to protect the living cell or the human embryo, the design bar was set very high. Why this one? Yes. So as an example of our design wish list, if you will, we wanted complete removal or elimination of all viable particulates and VOCs. So all living viruses, bacteria, fungi, and your volatile organic com compounds or anything basically that you can smell. We wanted to model the technology to be able to destroy the RNA and DNA of all infectious pathogens. And we wanted it tested. We're very data driven. So we wanted it tested by the National Homeland Security Research Center towards its kill of anthrax. Not because fortunately we weren't concerned about the anthrax spore, but if you're able to provide um, a high kill of the anthrax spore, you provide a nine log reduction of the infectious bacteria that really are impactful and those that we're far more concerned with like MRSA, C. diff, Pseudomonas, Legionella, Aspergillus, et cetera. And what's important also on our design criteria, we wanted this accomplished within a single pass. So when the air entered our system, we wanted the air leaving our system to have zero viable bacteria, viruses, and fungi. On the viral side, because of the ability of our technology to kill the anthrax spore, we also provide a nine log reduction of the viruses that, with which we have a greater concern, including COVID-19. Now, a lot of these are much smaller than a lot of the uh, capture models are able to remediate. And again, I'll, I'll go into uh, why we steered away from a capture model uh, based upon our own clinical experience. Moving on to the design criteria, again, we wanted 100% effectiveness, and I don't say that lightly, on a single pass. We didn't want the air to go through our system or through our technology five, 10, 20, 30 times. We wanted it to, be, to meet the metrics within a single pass through the technology. We absolutely could not have a technology that produced byproducts, ozone, or intermediate molecules. Uh, these typically, if you produce these, they can be uh, as, as uh, impactful as those you're trying to remove. We did not want a technology that was catalyst-based because catalysts degrade over time. Therefore, the delivery of your technology can degrade over time. And most importantly, we wanted an evidence-based technology, one that was uh, proven with environmental, clinical, and economic outcomes and uh, generating peer-reviewed publications. When we set out to design the system, we really worked backwards. We knew which airborne metrics we wanted to deliver, below detection bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and below detection volatile organic compounds. So that was our goal. And so we looked at a lot of the pre-existing technologies um, and to consider whether or not we should incorporate those into our design. So we did look at some in-room unit technology and that really wasn't consistent with our design goals. Um, the in-room units function by filtering what they see at that moment of time, but, but more importantly to us, they function uh, after the infectious pathogens are already in the space. And our goal was to completely remediate the infectious pathogens before they entered the space and then quickly after entering the space. So the in-room unit approach uh, was not consistent with our design criteria. We did look at a lot of UV uh, technology. It absolutely um, can be very effective, but what's very critical is that you look at that the UV um, algorithms be considered to model all HVAC metrics. You really need a thorough computational modeling to ensure the kill that you're trying to guarantee or provide. We also looked at HEPA, MERV, ALPA filtration to incorporate, 
And again, through our own clinical experience, we knew what had worked for us and what had not. Um, we actually had ALPA filtration bathed in UVC light. And obviously your HEPAs, your MERVs, your ALPAs are gonna capture based upon size and can be quite effective. All of your VOCs will go right through. And some of your smaller viral particles may not be 100% uh, captured. But what was an even greater concern to us clinically was the organics that were captured continue to grow above the space or if an in-room unit in the space that you're trying to protect. So the organics that are captured need two things to grow, food and water. Food can be the other organics, water is simply the humidity in the air. So we were actually capturing the things, um, trying to avoid their entry into our space, but yet they were continuing to proliferate right above. And we did have penetration of some of these spores. In addition, your fungal spores are gonna generate fungal VOCs, which can be very toxic. We also looked at a lot of the electronic air cleaners, some of your EAC technologies, PCO, needlepoint, bipolar ionization, plasma, hydrogen peroxide, and chose to stay away from these as well because a lot of these uh, require catalyst. And again, catalysts um, degrade over time. Therefore, the, the effectiveness of your technology can degrade over time. A lot of these also can produce uh, toxic byproducts or intermediate molecules, uh, free radicals, some produce VOC. So again, our goal was to remove the variable of air, not contribute any other byproducts by virtue of the technology. And finally, carbon and potassium permanganate, kind of the go-tos for VOC removal. Uh, these do work well, but only on certain biochemical families of VOCs. So again, for a variety of reasons, uh, we decided not to focus on, on the pre-existing technologies. Now I've mentioned single pass kill. So why was this so important to us? The environment that you're trying to protect is extremely dynamic. You have people, staff, patients, students, talking, breathing, shouting, singing, coughing, sneezing. Each of these produces a very significant and very specific viral load into the environment. The viral pathogens, um, it, it doesn't take much time for the viral pathogens to uh, cause an infection or an illness. And these pathogens can remain viable for long periods of time. And if not rapidly remediated, travel through the ductwork, through the return, say for example, from a classroom to an auditorium or from a classroom uh, to a gym, wherever the ductwork is connecting all the spaces. So this was something we absolutely did not want to happen and why the single pass kill was so, so critical to us. As I mentioned, our system is purposed, it's patented. We just received our 28th patent and have others pending and proven. Again, very significant. We've talked about the genesis of the system. So I'd like to briefly touch on two of very large clinical trials that have recently been conducted and are now published in peer reviewed journals. Relative to healthcare, working with Lee Levikoff and his colleagues at St. Luke's University Health Network, we installed our technology to protect half of a medical surgical floor. We had a second half that served as a control to the life air zone. And then we had a second uh, floor beneath it that served as the pure control. And again, the pure control being HEPA protected. We conducted some of the most aggressive and comprehensive air testing that can be, uh, that, that can occur. Basically looking at all viable bacteria and fungi within each patient room every month for 12 months. We also swabbed 10 of the most commonly touched patient and clinical surfaces. So basically we were able to map out every month within each study zone, airborne bacteria, fungi, and viruses, where they entered the room, where they traveled, and where they landed. Fast forward over 
500 slides of data that we could share. And all of this is published. So we'd be happy to share any of these publications with you. When you looked at the control floor HEPA protected and you look at viable fungi by air, viable fungi by surface, viable bacteria by air, and viable bacteria by surface. Each of these were found on the control floor over every month over a 12 month period. Very typical hospital flora. They were following all infection control guidelines and protocols, doing a great job using all the standard, uh, if not enhanced cleaning techniques. But in the HEPA protected area, this is the flora that was found in the air and on the surface. Each of these pathogens are, uh, are related or can cause an infection or an illness. In the life air protected clinical patient rooms, there was zero fungi and bacteria in the air, zero. And we had a 97% reduction in surface pathogens. One thing um, that is not well known, and this is um, facts from the CDC, that 90% of your infectious surface pathogens come from the air. So in the patient rooms that were protected by the life air technology, we had, I never like to say 100%, we had a 99% reduction of airborne biological, fungal, and viral loading in the patient room, and a 97% reduction on the surface. So we're basically removing two very common sources of illness, airborne and surface. As a result of that, there was a 30% reduction in infections. There was a 39% reduction in length of stay. Now, this is a key economic driver for the hospitals, giving them greater capacity um, to move patients through the med surge um, floor. And there was a $2.3 million uh, of savings to the hospital over the 12 month period. Relative to the second large clinical trial, one of our systems protected the entire floor. And this was in a senior living facility, long-term care. And again, they demonstrated the same results, very similar results as the um, clinical trial with St. Luke's showing a 99% reduction in airborne pathogens, 96% reduction in surface and a 39% reduction in infections or illness uh, versus the HEPA protected control floor. We were not looking for this data, but they shared with us that their staff callouts or you know, staff callouts due to illness dropped by 47% on the life air protected floor. And this is this fact may be very interesting to those of you in education, just trying to help protect uh, the wellness of your students, your professors, teachers, staff. In addition, to the reduction in infections, reduction in illnesses, all of our installations are protected, um, again, because of the design towards the anthrax kill, are protected against all of your seasonal viruses, including COVID-19. Uh, we will get through this pandemic, but what we need to consider is beyond COVID-19 and the variants, um, you know, and this, the seasonal more persistent viruses uh, that exist. As Michelle shared, our installed base includes leading US medical centers uh, beyond St. Luke's University Health Network. We're also installed in, installed in the Mayo Clinic, Stanford, Northwestern, uh, Duke, Wake, Yale, and others. So again, we've talked about the genesis of the technology, which drove the design, our design criteria. We've talked about the two very large uh, and published clinical trials. So now what I'd like to talk about is the application of this technology to protect your critical areas within education and the varying HVAC um, uh, design, um, you know, the, the, the varied um, design that supports your classrooms, your labs, study halls, cafeterias, you have a lot of traffic in and out of those rooms really the need for continuous and rapid remediation. Again, your viral loading is extremely dynamic. And all of this towards uh, protection and wellness 
and, and hopefully um, sustained attendance. So what I'd like to do is, is pass the baton uh, to my colleague, Lee Levikoff, again, VP of Planning and Construction Management. And uh, Lee, I'll pass this to you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I can go through, I could say doctor, inventor, founder, but I'll call you Katie if that's okay. Absolutely. Good. So um, for everybody to understand how this came about, I, I, well, first, I, if you're looking at this slide, I think everybody in healthcare already understands the acronyms, the Medical Surgical Units OR, uh, the PACU being uh, you know, post-anesthesia, which is a critical care, NICU is for children, the same type of stuff. Just want to let everybody know that we put these units, and that's an example of the bigger unit, um, next to my one of the presidents of one of the hospitals, the chief of uh, uh, medical, the uh, the woman on the right next to Katie. She is the chief nursing officer. You got one crazy guy in the background who's just in a t-shirt. That's that's me. So I didn't dress for the occasion. <laughs> And I'm sure that some of the people on this right now understand that. But that being said, it these this unit, Life Air, went everywhere that's the most important parts of the hospital. So this is the kind of um, the faith that we have in what this technology not only we thought could do, but not only has proven we can do. It's really easy to get my superiors to do because guess what? It saves money and it, it, it gets better care for our patients. So pretty much everything that Katie said. So to kick this off, we were Katie's lab rat. We, we, were, we were the first ones to try this. Um, it's the first ones in the hospital try this at least. We were the beta test. And because of that, um, and I think everybody, a lot of people on this in this conference understand that, you know, you've been there before when you're trying something different and you're trying to convince maybe your bosses or your direct reports that you want to look at something new. Thank God you won't be in a position where I was where, OK, where's the facts? Where's the books? Where's everything else? We, as in Katie and Life Air and us, as in St. Luke's, we developed that got it peer reviewed. We're actually in hardback books, which I never thought I'd be. So to let everyone know, you can rest assured that although we were the lab rat, we lived and we prospered and we're better off for it. So I, at least I want to say on that first slide, I know it looks, you know, kind of weird, but let me tell you, it was well worth it. And I think we'll go through the rest of these slides to where it's not only worth, well worth it, you're going to realize it's really easy. That I think is gonna resonate with everyone. Um, the dimensions of what you just saw was I believe the 4,000 and that's, that's six foot three in length. You guys can all read it. But I wanna make sure everybody understands that the electrical requirements are something you already have. It's not as if you have to build a new mousetrap for this thing. You pretty much, if you don't, you'll get one very quickly. It's a dedicated circuit and it's only 20 amp. So in, in essence, this is something that you really don't have to do anything and worry about. Can this work where we are? It's 500 pounds. This is the bigger unit. And we'll get into the sizes. One of the bigger units. Um, you, you hold your duct work up with straps. It's going, I'm going to be talking more construction now and everything else because, again, I'm not the scientist. I'm just a construction guy. You can hang this with straps like you do with your ductwork. You can even better hang this off all thread. When you find a space for it, you don't see it, you don't hear it, so it's easy. The pressure drop that you normally get, which I heard all day from all the other, you know, quote, solutions, it's negligible with this. In fact, there's none for the most part, and we design it to make sure of that. It's not clogging up filters. It's not really starting to affect your CFM. We design around that. And for the, nature, for the fact that it's just a pure kill system, these things literally don't sit there and, and clog your air. Another thing where we all run into as facilities guys and construction people, you'll lose power once in a while. 
you'll go on generator, you'll do these things are our media mitigation of those issues. But again, with life air, they've built that into it too, because when it goes down, it automatically goes up when you get your power back. You don't have to go chase it, turn on a switch, hope it works after the power went down. This will do it for you. It is easily connected to your management systems. So that's even better. So even under perfect circumstances, you can monitor this. That being said, the plug and play model you all understand what that means, is what this is. Pick a spot, Lifefair will design it. They'll make sure it works the optimal um, situation for what you need. It can go in existing, what you saw that first picture, went into an existing uh, facility. They modeled it, we put it on Revit and it fit perfectly, got done in four hours. And it is still to this day, one of the most, I would say, you are not going to be inconvenienced, which is a big worry for everybody in schools and in hospitals. It's not going to be something that everybody comes up to you and says, what are you doing? You're in and out and you've accomplished so much because the installation time is so long. We provide a turnkey. So if you're thinking, oh my God, you're going to do this, this big unit, you guys are going to drop it off of our door and you're going to say to us, here it is, go put it in. That's not life here. We have a turnkey solution. When we walk into a room and you show it to us where you want this thing, and we Revit model, just like what you're looking now. I don't know if it'll run. I, I hope it does. We will build this system, as you can see, and you people that are used to this are used to seeing the 3D modeling. We will put this where you need it. We will do the ICRA if necessary, which is hospital talk. <laughs> but if schools understand that too, we won't create any dust that anybody's going to walk or breathe in. We will fix your ceilings if it's an existing situation. We'll paint the room if we've done any damage. If we've done any damage on the floor, we redo the floor. We will be able, we'll bring power. We'll bring the controls. We'll be in and out of there. You won't even know we're there. In the end, you'll be able to take all the credit because it got done and it really didn't involve any kind of heartache. No agita, if I've got any Italian people, no heartache. We even labeled it like that so you know where it is. As a result, however, to, these, to the coronavirus, we've created the smaller models for areas that you need to get done right away and could be done in a short period of time to be able to help you get through what you need to get through. And the big units would actually cover even more area. These units that you're looking at right now, they go in your ceiling, they get cut into your ductwork, very simple cut. And what everybody understands is the old adage, you know, 10 pounds of S, in a five pound box. I think we all have that. Hospitals specifically, we've got med gases, we've got sprinklers, we got water power. It's spaghetti up in the ceilings. And everybody would say, how will you fit this large unit in my ceiling? Well, we come prepared with that. The BioLite and the BioMid can take care of that. They fit on the side of the duct or underneath the duct, they get cut in and that's your solution. It's another thing Katie's invented to make sure it works well for everybody. Next slide. Um, again, this, this, is, um, this basically tells you the sizes and CFMs for these smaller units. What it really shows you, and you can tell by putting things and installing things in your lifetime, how simple this is. And I think that adds to your comfort that if you right now are designing for bigger systems, whether it be new or old, these will take care of the up to 7,100 CFM. And then you just add units, like it says there, if you want to read it, to cover even more areas. That's how flexible and agile life air systems are. Whatever you need, we either design to or already have units that can do that. 
This is an example of how simple it is to cut the unit in. You can see the blue, you can see the, the, the technology inside. That's literally a piece of ductwork we cut open. It's an access panel. You put a cutoff switch. Everybody, a lot of people on this do understand what I mean. You connect to the ballast, you have a control and you're done. Next slide. Um, I guess that would be Katie. I can, I, I'm happy to Lee. Thank you. But I do want to, I do want to say one more thing if it's okay. Absolutely. Nobody wants to be second when it comes to this kind of technology. I think we all have heard all day that HEPA and all the other, but Katie already mentioned these methodologies that supposedly work, but they do say they work to a certain extent. Um, everybody's using them. And because of that, the science doesn't back up whether or not it is as effective as it should be. This is a kill technology. This is something where maybe we were the lab rat, maybe we were the first hospital, but everybody on this conference understands, I would hope, that you're not second. We're bringing this to market. This is the first conference we're doing it at for healthcare and for education. You're the first to hear this. So I hope you understand that when we do this and show you all this, this is not something that your competition's gonna know about until everybody knows. You're the first, not the second. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And um, I think, you know, I mean, we're a very healthcare centric company. Uh, our genesis was really inspired by our patients and we're driven every day uh, to improve, improve patient care, wellness, provide protection. So, you know, if there's, if there's um, any questions or, or publications or clarifying questions that we can answer, we'd be happy to. And I think just, um, you know, ask for studies, ask for the evidence that backs up the claims and, um, and, and you'll, make, you'll make the right decisions for you, your colleagues, your students, uh, your staff, and most importantly, uh, stay safe and well. So we thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie and Lee. Um, I'm waiting for some questions to pop in through the platform. I don't have anything just yet, but um, I do have some questions for myself. Um, how do you assure complete kill with the old and varying HVAC layouts across different spaces um, in different schools? That's a great question, Michelle. Um, honestly, every, every set of drawings are, are completely unique to one another. So. Our engineers look at all of the HVAC metrics, the size of the ductwork, air velocity, um, the type of ductwork material, the air handler, the size of the space they want to protect. And we basically use um, our own algorithms uh, for computational modeling to say this life air solution, this size in this location is gonna deliver a kill of this list of, of viruses and pathogens. And we actually give them a table uh, specific to their area of, of what viruses, bacteria, and fungi will be killed on, again on a single pass. Um, one question that came in is, there is so much conflicting information on the efficacy of UV light application. How do you respond to this? Our system has been in place protecting the human embryo now, and, and as you said, in over 50 locations in just the United States. And it's, it's consistently supporting the growth of one of the most sensitive um, cells in existence, not only supporting, but enhancing. So that was our starting point. And we also, it's also proven not to produce byproducts. So everything that we've shared in this PowerPoint and in this discussion is backed by, by evidence and, and data. Is so, this a UV technology? Yes, it is. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, that, no, that's all right, that's all right. I think what's unique about Life Air is we started at the most difficult endpoint. We started with trying to protect the most sensitive cell and then worked from there now with patients, staff, residents. 
Okay. Um, given that HEPA is viewed as our gold standard, how is um, the life air technology better? We intentionally uh, did not choose to put a capture model into our, our design. Um, again, because the capture model is only going to capture uh, certain sizes and all of your volatile organic compounds grow right through a HEPA filter. So with our goals of delivery of below detection bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and below detection VOCs, the capture model was not going to deliver that. And um, my final question is, um, what is the time frame for manufacturing and installation? It depends on which solution that you're describing. So the, the full system that Lee began describing, that's about five to seven weeks. Um, the, smaller, the smaller solutions are a matter of several weeks. Okay. Um, we've got about 60 seconds before we end. So just wanted to see if um, either of you had any final thoughts before um, you two sign off. Only one. I keep getting this nice little drip sound and I've got Salem Stutzer, Henrym and Adam Tom. And I hear that sound. Are they asking questions or? Nope. Um, that could be from my other laptop, the sound from there. Okay. <laughs> But, I, didn't, um, I didn't want anybody to get by without getting an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam and Salem are our next um, speakers. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and, and just one clarifying point, Michelle, you asked about is this, I think there was a question, is this UV technology? It is, but also what we learned through our own clinical experience is UV is not UV. So there are a lot of metrics you have to consider with dwell time, residence time, reflectivity. There are a lot of metrics to be considered for UV to be effective. So that's a very, very important point. All right, and um, one other question did come in. So we'll just do this as a last question. Did you experience challenges with BSL-23 installations considering the pathogens in the areas? We are not currently in a BSL-3 laboratory. We're primarily in uh, human cell culture, human IVF, and now healthcare space, critical care spaces in healthcare and long-term care. Okay. All right, well, that will be it for today. And of course- We're not there, um, we're not there yet. We're not Her there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be, be there. Correct. Be if somebody wants to call, sure. Yeah. <laughs>